we're on. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Thanks for inviting me, and I see a lot of familiar faces. Hi, Alan. <laughs> so, um, oh, there we go. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about how your economic development office can benefit you as a small business owner, but first I kind of like to give just a little overview about just what the economic development office does and kind of Chandler's philosophy behind that and how we partner with Gangplank and how that's pretty uh, forward thinking as far as the ways that cities go and who they partner with and I think will shape Chandler uh, to be a winner in the future. Um, so again, my name is Lori Kwan, I'm an economic development specialist. I work with primarily companies who would go in office or industrial uh, properties. I also work with a lot of the startup tech ventures as well. A um, little bit of background on me, I have about 10 years experience in economic development in this market from you know, working on the regional level to just the city level and also uh, was a marketing director for a commercial real estate firm here in town and in the Vegas office. So, have a pretty panoramic experience, but it gives you something when you really find kind of your groove and where it is that you know that you're supposed to be, and that's one of those places that I think I found here in the Chandler office, and then a lot of the connections that I've been able to make along the way, it makes my job a lot more fun to go to every day, and it really makes you feel like you're making a difference. So, um, I'll run this myself. <laughs> so we've kind of termed Chandler and its business environment as this platform for possibility. We understand that if if from an economic development perspective, if all of the essential operating components are in place, um, you should be able as a business to just come and plug right in. If your business is a good fit with the community, we'd like to see from the city's perspective that everything's there so that your business can ultimately be successful. Um, that in has included a lot of different things along the way and it's evolving each year. And especially some of our current economic climate now has really caused this to evolve in the way that we approach it, but not just from basic philosophy. Basic philosophy behind economic development, just a real quick 101, is if you have a great general plan to follow, you put smart people together with a great community where they, those smart people feel like they can plug in, and then you have the real estate for them to grow their business, expand, go to work every day. That's kind of been the traditional model for economic development. A good general plan, which Chandler has had one, um, we uh, send it out to the voters uh, pretty regularly for everyone to review, and we have been pretty fortunate from a leadership perspective to have folks that um, uh, really stay true to what general leadership has provided. Sorry, Is that a I clicker? Just, yes, it's a clicker and now I just missed you. That's okay, I'll pause. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a lot better. Can you, while, he, while he's doing that, uh -huh. can you kind of explain the, and not necessarily the hierarchy, but the makeup of an economic development office? Sure, well the way that ours is made up, um, and a lot of cities aren't like this, but we have, the city is set up on a city manager, city council uh, framework. We, the city council sets policy and direction, the city manager administers the staff that um, carry, ultimately carries out that vision. So our economic development office answers directly to the city manager's office and, and sometimes in that hierarchy you don't always see an economic development office with that much prominence. Um, we feel like that's something that's been Chandler's competitive, competitive advantage. Um, we have a director, her name's Christine Mackey, myself and James Smith are the economic development specialists. My colleague James focuses on retail and entertainment and some of those small businesses that may go in those retail spaces. Like I said, I focus on um, tech startups, our incubator, um, groups like this, uh, the connections that we take a lot of the workforce issues and work with any tenants that go with in office and industrial properties. We also have a tourism office in our office because Chandler doesn't have a convention and visitors bureau, so that makes us a little unique too. A research assistant, and we are a pretty small group. <laughs> but what we try to do, though, too, is leverage every resource that we have. So we're um, members with the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. We work closely with the Arizona Commerce Authority, formerly the Arizona Department of Commerce. We keep pretty solid relationships with the commercial real estate community as well as the universities. Is it working? Okay. Unpause then. <laughs> So this has kind of been the traditional way of looking at economic development is to make sure that all these four components, general components, are in place. 
from the plan perspective, as far as Chandler goes, we've always focused on being, and this is always, I, if you, I had a guest blog a couple of months ago here with Gangplank and talked about a city being really true to its DNA. You want to find something that's authentic. Chandler's always been a well-planned city. It's always been one of those places that embraces an entrepreneurial spirit. You can trace it all the way back to our founder with A.J. Chandler and the way that he uh, was pretty innovative in some of the things that he did. You know, he went on a trip to Egypt. He brought back Egyptian cotton and figured out how, you know, here's this bioengineered cotton, basically, that's designed to grow in an arid environment and, and brought it here. He's also, um, you know, the ostriches and the ostrich festival that we just had. Uh, he was pretty innovative in the way that he sought after water. And after a lot of research, we also found out that back in 1903, he had purchased a um, solar unit in order to generate steam for the pump stations to pump water out of the canals. Pretty innovative, right? So here's something that's pretty, is authentic to who we are. And that's what we've planned in our general plan. We know that freeways and accessibility, people movers, that type of thing is essential from an infrastructure standpoint. And so we've built protected employment corridors around those. Right now in Chandler we have Price Corridor, Downtown, the Air Park area, North Chandler and West Chandler. Those all have a unique characteristics to them just because either the way that the companies have clustered, but largely driven by the infrastructure that's there. For instance, in Price Corridor, Chandler, and a lot of the East Valley knew that we wanted to be a hub for semiconductors and electronics. Um, in order to make that happen, there were some significant investments in infrastructure that had to take place. So, you know, there's really nothing sexy about what's under the street, but it really is what wins projects. It's what keeps Intel here, the high capacity wet utilities that they have access to. And also so they, there's an ultra pure nitrogen line that runs um, from air products down the center of the road. So instead of having truck in nitrogen, which is a pretty essential um, you know, material for the semiconductor industry, they can just tap into the line in the street. So it saves them some money and it really um, kind of tricks out that corridor from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, so we started looking at then trying to be pretty forward thinking and knowing that we're always trying to focus on the infrastructure, then we look at what type of people do we want to attract. And that's where there's, there's a visioning document out available on the website called Chandler the Next 20. They went through it in 2005 to 2007 time frame, a little bit before I got to the city, but it's one of the things that really made me want to work here. Um, you can see where they talk about where you need to have some innovation zones. What are you going to do to keep and attract those really talented, innovative thinkers? And so, we kind of, the Einstein picture is just there to represent what we're looking for. We know that Chandler's been a hub, it's been a great place, it's always attra been attractive to innovative thinkers, um, not just those people who are uh, you know, it, Intel employees, they're people who may leave from Intel and start their own business. They, you know, we have a lot of startups that open up satellite offices out here because the IC analog talent that we have in this market. Um, we know too from the global location of a lot of our large employers, there's kind of a inherent global mindset that exists in our community that you don't see in a lot of others. We've been surprised. Um, I pleasantly surprised. We kind of knew it's there, but when you actually hear from people just how amazing the depth of language talent is, and I think a lot of that has to do with we're a globally aware community. You see that in our restaurants and the festivals and things that we have here too. We also have a gen uh, uh, it garnered attention for being a pretty productive workforce too. So if we're looking at these are the types of people that we want to attract. The second thing that we really look at, and I kind of started calling them lifestyle expectations. Quality of life is one of those phrases that's just been thrown out and tromped all over and overused and people like blah, 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 glaze over once you start saying quality of life. But we know what essentially what that is, is there's lifestyle expectations that exist for the creative class, for the idea industry workers, for people who are more on the educated spectrum of things. And so from Chandler's perspective, we've always looked at how do we keep creating an environment where people want to live, where people wanted to stay no matter where their, you know, their career may lead them. Um, so there's a good mix and we also know, I know Derek and Jade and I back when we <laughs> started talking always kind of joked around, this is kind of the place where the creative class grows up. It's not always where you'll see the huge concentration of clubs and watering holes, you, but you will see those people who want to drive to them but then still have a backyard or good schools for their kids to go to. It's something that's a little bit shift in their mindset and really it's a place that Chandler is pretty comfortable in occupying for that, that group of people. Um, and we pay very close attention to it. It's why 
uh, we have someone in our office that's solely focused on attracting those retail, those unique dining experiences. We have a coalition called Local Bites that is there to, um, and we partner with Local First Arizona to really uh, promote those independent and unique to the market um, restaurants and we hope that you'll go on and find those and, and enjoy them too. Um, but that's pretty key to creating this great place. And then finally there's an inventory and we work with commercial developers, we work with uh, the real estate community to make sure that we have a proper place in enough, in, in enough different places to meet the needs of most businesses. Now a few years ago we kind of ran into a problem when um, you know, we had the right plan, we had the concentration of the right people, great ideas. This is a community where people wanted to grow their business, but we didn't have exactly the space that they were looking for. And I'm speaking specifically to the bio industry. A lot of those small startup spaces, we were able, when they would contact us, say, we want to be in Chandler, we want to have a Chandler business address. That was pretty important to us. Um, we were able to you know, go and talk to our large employers and find out little spaces. You know, do you have 500 feet you can give this company? And so they'd carve out that space for them and do a little lease. And you know, it, it's expensive to build out that type of space. So what happens when this happens is you build your own. <laughs> so, and it's not, it's not been something that a lot of people do. Uh, the city, uh, in 2009, we approached city council. We'd been planning this for five years. We approached the city council and we said, you know, we have to have a space that that we can build out and have an incubator space. And we found an old building, in, an old Intel building that had all of the infrastructure there and saved the city about $6 million by going into this older Intel building. We are the master leaseholder on about 40,000 square feet, which is now Innovations. Um, so we know, you guys are all familiar with the idea of an incubator, right? Yes. <laughs> so we know that that's a great place to grow healthy businesses until they're healthy enough to move out on their own. Um, same way as you know you would a, a chicken before it hatches from the egg or before a baby that's born prematurely. We, we want to nurture them. So it's not just the space that we're providing, but there's a number of educational opportunities that we like to connect those folks with um, so that a lot of times people are good at their science but not so good at their business savvy. And so we like to equip them with that. Um, so I'll show you something that's neat. So this is what the building looked like before. Intel hadn't touched it, it had been empty for about five years. It's 129,000 square feet total. Um, and we, like I said, we have about 40,000 of that. Um, and this is what it looks like now. It's really pretty. And then you can see we, University of Arizona has 7,000 square feet uh, in that space. About 24 researchers from their work on a daily basis. Um, which I know made a lot of people in here happy <laughs> to see U of A. <laughs> but the, um, uh, well, you, know, you see the wet lab space, it's designed to be turnkey. They're about half wet lab space and half dry lab that can quickly go and become um, wet lab space. Uh, there's actually a, like a co-lab environment where if people only need a bench, they can lease that bench. Or if they need just a row of benches, they can lease that as well. We have all kinds of neat companies that are in there. In fact, give me a call or maybe we could set up some time for another brown bag just to do it out at the incubator for people to take a tour. But um, it has conference room space um, and a little uh, kitchen area, well, pretty big kitchen area, so we could even have it in there. But it's, um, it's a really neat environment. It's fun to see so many different people walking around. We've, we know that collaboration is king these days, so we've designed all these, these um, spaces for people to bump into. There's whiteboards everywhere, and we've been amazed, too, at the collaboration that's already taking place at the incubator. So we know that that means a pretty specific need. In our, in our community, and it's been pretty leading edge. You know, we're kind of on the, the leading edge of that wave when it comes to incubators, and probably the only one in the country right now that the city owns the incubator. Usually it's partnered with the university, but we actually run the incubator, partner with a, a nonprofit, and the university takes space in our incubator. So it's a pretty unique model. But what we think has been something that's, that has been forward thinking, um, even more so than just an incubator, because you know, like I said, there's already been a number of models for that. It's our special relationship that we have with Gangplank. Um, we, you know, there was a, if I can speak frankly, there was a lot of communities that were looking and wanting to have a Gangplank, but we knew we couldn't just wear Gangplank like a designer label. It was something that we needed to, we couldn't just have it be something that we touted in our marketing materials. I probably spend five to ten hours 
each week easily working <laughs> with different people from Gangplank on the events that we can help host that serve our workforce, on um, connecting just people together, talking, you know, making sure that the Commerce Authority is helping folks uh, with their research and development tax credit applications, things like that, um, that has just been driven solely by our relationship with Gangplank. So what it's done is we saw it as a tool to expand our reach to an audience who normally wouldn't reach out to the city and ones that we really couldn't find. We saw it as a place to continue to create an environment for startups to grow um, and also we thought that this would be the way to cause the greatest impact because we saw a lot of like-minded people uh, here within the Gangplank community that we that it, it became an easy sell when she started telling city council look we have a a history of making sure the infrastructure is right for an environment where businesses can grow. We think this is an additional form of infrastructure, not just a co-working space, but an attitude, a, a commitment to help the community grow. So real quick though too, what happens when this stops working altogether? Um, you know, Chandler has, and we still are, even though the economy has caused great concern for a lot of people, the Great Recession has hit, um, and we've seen a lot of the, the bottom basically fall out. Um, Chandler's still been able to reach a lot of those companies that would look at expanding to, you know, they want a West Coast location, but they don't want to be in, in California, so they expand in Chandler. We've seen a lot of those big wins take place, like eBay, PayPal, over 2,000 jobs. Um, the Intel announcement is huge. And um, we've seen still where we're able to attract a lot of those large announcements, kind of, I call it press release economic development, because <laughs> it's the ones that everybody wants to pay attention to, but we've had so many great wins in seeing our startups grow at our incubator and seeing the things that are taking place here. And there's some questions though that we had to start looking at when the world of work changes and when people's attitude towards, towards corporations change and when people's attitude towards what they're hoping to get out of life changes. And so this is kind of where I stop and I have to editorialize a little bit. So these are, I, um, and I have a disclaimer, these aren't necessarily the attitudes reflected by the city of Chandler. <laughs> but, <It's like> <laughs> so I started watching, um, and I know you're going to look at this like, what do those two have in common? Maybe being both a little dreamy, but not, you know, there's not really too much else that they have in common. The, but I'll tell you something that I've learned by just, you know, being a big fan of Richard Florida and um, recently becoming a big fan of uh, Mad Men. Have you guys all watched it? I kind of came to the party pretty late and just started watching them whole seasons at a time. And I don't know how often you do this, but there's something that we can follow the or swallow the fantasy a little bit easier in hour-long doses. <laughs> it starts to look pretty absurd when you watch it all at the same time. Same thing. Yeah. I, I couldn't stop watching it after I had to watch, stop watching it because I'm like, this is grossing me out. Yes, and not grossing me out from the way they treated women or not, I mean, that, that was pretty distasteful. But what started, what occurred to me was the way like, oh, this is where the American dream began to be packaged and sold to you, spoon-fed to you on this is how you're supposed to act from eight to five, this is the house that you're supposed to buy and all the way that you're supposed to empty your pockets in order to find happiness. I think that as the recession hit and we started seeing more and more people's lives impacted by buying into that American dream and the, the effect that it had on people's psyche on what did I do wrong here, how come I'm losing my house, how come I'm losing my job, really started, and as more and more people started talking, and I think a lot of it has to do with the way that we're connected to each other, the way that we can quickly authenticate information and messages that are coming our way. I think that what you can learn from these two, as Richard Florida says, there will be a spatial shift that occurs as a result of this Great Recession. I don't know if I 100% agree with him that it'll be a mass flooding to urban areas, because I th still think there's a case to be made about suburbs. He does kind of touch on that in the terms of mega regions and things like that. But when something is illuminated the way that Mad Men does, on the way that that American dream is bought and packaged, and people start seeing things like grandma's work in the door at Walmart, you don't have your pension anymore, I know my parents were struggling with that, you, know, you don't really see people work for 30 years at the same company anymore, you don't even really see people stay for a company for three years, and then you see enough people start to go, that has nothing to do with me, I know intrinsically that I have value and talent and I'm going to do this on my own. So what it started to do, for me at least, was start to go, 
how do we reach out to those people and still make them part of our business environment? So I started calling them location neutral earners. <laughs> it's not just like home based business because I think sometimes that has a connotation that really doesn't, isn't embraced by our, our uh, um, you know, it's not embraced really by politicians as well as that those are somebody that's important to embrace in the uh, environment here in the business community. But they are, when you start looking at the incomes that could be generated, the amount of extra time that folks like that have that they can invest in the community and in their kids' schools and on the you know, baseball team, it really starts to create a much more rich and deep community um, that creates the communities I think that will succeed in the future. So if I can bring it back to then what that ultimately means for a platform for possibility <laughs> is when the bottom falls out, a platform for possibility can no longer be the tagline that Chandler uses. It can't be just the physical infrastructure being in place. It has to then become the paradigm for government. And I think that our local government does operate this way. It has to be something that we realize we have to do what's necessary to create an environment for business success, no matter what that business looks like. Um, we know that just inherent to the community, there are certain industries that thrive and there's certain talent that's attracted here. So then we're starting to look at what are ways that we can continue to foster that growth here in Chandler. And um, that's one thing I'd like to open up to you as you travel, as you are those people that make up the either the location neutral earner, the, the small startups, we'd like to hear from you and tell us how we can help you out. Tell us the types of things that we need to be interfacing on your behalf with the state with. Um, there are you know, a number of tools that are available and so come and talk to me and you know, we can just have some conversation and figure out how we can start connecting you with the right people. Um, you feel free to, you know, we try to share different events, like when something's happening over here, we try to let the innovations folks know and we'll do our best to make sure when innovation's having something that we'll let you guys know. Um, but also when you run into something, when you see something from another community, send it our way, because we do do a lot of modeling, not that we're trying to be Austin and we're not trying to be Boulder, we're trying to be Chandler, but we're gonna pull those best practices out of places like that. So in addition to working with you know, just businesses to find a right space for them, I also work on this kind of philosophical stuff <laughs> on really trying to shape the language and the way that we as the city talk about how we're moving forward in economic development. There's really no other way, I don't think, to survive the recession and the way that, you know, it's kind of the, the thinning of the herd, I think, for communities that are really going to survive and the ones that are going to be left standing at the end of this. So we're really happy with our partnership with Gangplank you know, to do things that reach out to our workforce like the Agile or, or Scrum training, like, um, like WordCamp, um, the, all the user groups that are available. We really like that because it helps, again, expand our reach and, and let us touch the workforce that we need to, that we like to see grow here. We'd like to be the epicenter of all of that. So remember that the platform for possibility, I think it is a paradigm for government. It's got to be those essential operating components, all those pieces that you need have to be here in place and that's what then businesses can come in on top of and build and grow. And we're committed to making sure that that's possible and we're also committed to making sure that that conversation stays open with you and we'd love to hear more about it. And I didn't want to take up too much time because you don't know if you have questions, but there's always great things happening in Chandler and it's hard to fit them all into a slide. So I left the time for questions and um, thanks again for letting me talk for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, Katie? Um, so you're, you're the only voice that can be heard, so if you can repeat my question. Sure. Um, so I think we've done lots of talks about the challenges to entrepreneurs within our own community. From an economic development perspective, what do you see as the challenge to small businesses and startups? Well, so I, I'm a marketing person by background. And I think that people in general respond to stories. I think language in general has to change. Like I said, the press release economic development, what are the, the question was how do we, what do I see as the challenges for entrepreneurial growth? Um, I think specifically in Arizona. For, for so long, Arizona's kind of grabbed the low-hanging fruit coming in, you know, fleeing from California. It's been the ones, those, you know, the big 
you know, economic development wins, 1,000 jobs here, 2,000 here, 500 here, 600, and those are great because we need jobs. But we also have to start filling in from the bottom. And sometimes I think just because the language that we use, or you hear small business, or you hear automatic way people interpret that as maybe retail, or which is bolstered by generally by having job growth. So I think the language has to change. It has to be, we have to find some way to make that inherently more valuable at the first level that people hear it. Um, but I also see, you know, there's a huge budget crisis. Nobody likes to see handouts and tax credits, and, and that's something that's really difficult too. Um, sometimes it's just the sharing of resources. I think one of the things that we probably need to do better from a statewide economic development uh, entity as well as Chandler is really codify where all those resources are so that people don't have to go to multiple places or they don't have to wait for a return phone call from me. It's something that we have to all put together so that when you know what you need, you can just go and, and find it quickly. It's a quick answer. But <laughs> Anything else? Katie? <laughs> So, like, let's, we have quite a few small business owners in here right now. If they wanted to step one, if they wanted to get or build a relationship with their economic development office, obviously talk to you, but mm -hmm. what are some other ways that they can start learning about the resources available to them? I'm really just by talking to me, and then I kind of, whenever I hear things too, I like to pass that along. Um, it's our website. It has some good resources that are on it. Sometimes they need interpreting. You know, the, a lot of the incentives that are available and help for small businesses is run through at a state level. Um, what we can do is find out if you do fit that, then we have relationship with those folks. We travel with them. We get trade show blisters together. We do all of those things. So sometimes when you <laughs> spill blood together, there's some relationship that you have. So if there's applications and things that are stuck, we can also help kind of push that through. Um, but the first thing would be just introduce yourself and tell us what you're looking for. Tell us what you do. Because there's something that's kind of in intangible that I think our office does really well that you don't often see. Um, if I know what you do and I know there's another Chandler company um, that needs that service, we really try hard to connect those together. We like to see our businesses using each other. We had, case in point, uh, we were next to a Tempe company at a medical design and manufacturing show and they were looking for somebody that could do kind of one-offs on the, like a metal stamping side for them. And uh, I knew that there was a Chandler company way across the floor, but they were looking at people in Pennsylvania, they were looking in Ohio. So I ran over and I got the guy from Chandler and brought him over and introduced them and now they use each other. I would like to not have to travel to make that type of connection, but I'm willing to do it. So it's those types of things. Just let us know, introduce yourself and, and we'll, we'll be good cheerleaders for you to help it and useful. We'll try to put some tools into your hands. That's, yeah, Alan. How do you how do you or do you interact with other municipalities mm -hmm. uh, how do you spread these ideas into other municipalities or you know what kind of partnerships do you create sure um, the question was how do we partner with other communities municipalities nearby um, we do that with, on a number of, of in a number of ways I know a lot of them because Arizona is just kind of been you go from one place to another there's not always a lot of new blood that comes in on economic development um, but we are members of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, so we do sit down a lot, we travel a lot together, I'm representing the region as a whole. That is largely a business attraction entity though, so they really are going after those you know, significant capital investment companies, but that gives us a chance to work, though again, still on that business environment together and what that looks like. Um, there's some other things, you know, we realize that we're sharing resources, we know that as much as you like to have Chandler be the one that is the one that companies choose, if they can choose Tempe and Chandler residents can still be employed there, that's still a win for us. Um, so we have this kind of friendly competition. <laughs> we call it uh, cooperation, I think sometimes. <laughs> but the, um, and we do have a good relationship with a lot of our, our fellow municipalities. Um, I gotta tell you though, some of the budget has been wiping some of those offices clean. It's, it's unfortunate to see. So we're fortunate that our office has been able to retain everybody that we have, um, which again I think is just testament to that's how important it is to our community. Um, but we're always looking at ways to, to augment those relationships, to 
you know, we don't want to be, no, you can't help you if you're not in Chandler's borders. So does that kind of help yeah. answer the question? Okay. Jade? So uh, what, do you, what do you see as some of the most like promising developments in economic development, theory-wise or practice? Like, you know, what, what are you seeing for the next 10 years that is really setting the course? Hmm. Well, I think those not driving, the, oh, the, the question was, what do you see kind of coming wave next economic development thing that's going to help you know, foster what are, what's, what are this healthy economic development look like? Basically, what do we see? Um, we do look at that a lot. We kind of lately have been focused on kind of the Mountain West region. I would hate to look to the models of kind of the Rust Belt, although you kind of have to a little bit to see the way that a community kind of rises from the ashes. We have looked at like Detroit and Pittsburgh and some of the changes that are taking place there and the focus on innovation and partnering with universities, how to really build talent. I think that that's where the focus is going to go. I think that's the only way that it can go. It, the real estate focus needs to become a little bit secondary than the actual building the people that occupy those buildings or not the people that are location neutral. You know, my husband works from his mobile phone and a stage. That's it. That's all he needs. He doesn't, he's not a, technically a home-based business. And that makes, a, that makes a big difference. I think more and more we'll see the communities that cater to those location neutral and you know, build talent and have enough places then that talent can go to that they don't have to leave the community. I also think the ones that focus on integrating the industries that they would like to see with things on the elementary school level is going to be very, very important. It has to be something that it inherently trickles down and affects that. But if you have ideas too, share them, send them our way. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, thank you, Lori. Thank you.